I was born in England uh, in 1968. In 1975, my parents decided to bring us out to Australia, and I'll be honest with you people, as a seven-year-old, I wasn't that keen on coming out to Australia, mainly because I used to watch a TV show called Skippy. <laughs> so I figured I knew a bit about Australia, and I really wasn't that keen on the idea that if I fell down a cliff, I was going to have to rely on a kangaroo to help my parents. <laughs> I got out to Australia in 1975 and I found out that I was lied to by the TV show Skippy because I had to go to school. <laughs> yeah, proper school, a building. You know, I thought I'd be going to school on the radio, school of the air, like Sonny Hammond. But no, went to a school. And get this, my first English teacher in an Australian primary school was a young German woman. <laughs> Yeah, and she didn't like me very much, and I don't know whether it's because at seven years of age I could see the irony of the situation that a German person was teaching me English. <laughs> or because I called my school project How England Won the War. <laughs> Gary, before moving to Sydney to become a comedian, you were living in Adelaide as a goat farmer. Well, years ago I was living as a goat farmer. My family had a goat farm when I was growing up and um, we used to breed and show the goats and live off the milk and all that sort of stuff but it, when I was 18 I, I left home originally, joined the army, came back um, and then moved to Sydney as a comedian and uh, so the goats were a long time ago. Like my dad was a mechanical engineer and um, he was working six days a week to support the family but we were on a country property. My sister and I got a job at the local goat farm and milked a hundred goats every morning before school and every afternoon after school for two dollars each a day. How long do they take each one? Well we're on machines. I oh, say so you didn't get to have a feel. No, you, you <laughs> gave a bit of a squirt, right? You know, you squirt out like because they, you know, they have a bit of like build up of like, you know, from the milk from last time that, that you know, sort of dries up, you know, like some, you know. <laughs> So, you know, something might dry on the end of it and you'd squirt that bit off through a, like a gauze thing and then you'd whack on the suction cups and suck all the milk out of the udder. And how has this helped you later in life? Yeah, what did you learn from that? <laughs> it helped me learn, you know, what a man was supposed to do and uh, unfortunately I used the technique the goats used which was like get it over with as quickly as possible and then be ready for a second go. <laughs> The suction machine that goes on the goat, are they different sizes or is it one size fits all? Well, it's one size fits all, yeah, you'll find that, I mean, the, the goats will have different sized teats, um, but the, the suction cup, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big hole and it's got a sucking type of motion and it sort of sucks on as you put it like on. a vacuum cleaner. like a vacuum exactly like a vacuum cleaner so you know what our next question is going to be did i ever try it myself <laughs> <laughs> no but I, it, the thought did enter my mind because i was going through puberty at the time you got past the goats <laughs> got past the goats and joined the army what division of the army did you join well i joined the army band you know, a lot of people don't know that the army even has a band, but um, in fact a lot of people around the world don't even know we've got an army. Being the band, did, did, you, did you get guns? Or? I did basic training, so it meant I, I, I learnt how to kill people, right? I got a, issued a weapon, an SLR they were, they don't use them anymore, 7.62 millimetre rimless NATO round, yeah, that was the standard issue, that was the weapons used in Vietnam and they had them for us because, you know, they didn't know what the next war was going to be. Do the army bush stuff and then got in the band and then I just basically played music and marched around playing music. It's not a bad life for a musician because um, you get a regular pay come in, you know, and as a, which is a bit odd for a musician, a really. Yeah. It's unheard of almost. <laughs> So what instrument did you play in the band or did they teach you other instruments? No, well I, um, I already played clarinet and saxophone before I went in. I, I did it at high school and I did it, um, I was doing it at college, I was doing a jazz course. And I wanted to get away from the farm and, you know, see what the rest of the world had to offer. And there was this opportunity to join an army band and get paid to play music. And I was at the level where I could audition for the, the band. I played clarinet and saxophone at the audition and I played that in the band. You know, they, they give you lessons and improve your quality of your playing. And Where did the uh, army band take you? I went around the country in 1988, um, did the big military tattoo, part of the bicentennial celebrations. I always look at the military bands and I think, God, I, if I was a musician, 
I, I wouldn't enjoy it because you, you just seem to play March stuff, don't you? Well, that's that's a bit of a misconception, I think. Um, definitely, you do all that stuff, but these days it's a lot different. And the the military bands, they have a rock band, they have a jazz band. You know, um, they play all styles of music, and they'll take a small group and they go over to tours over to Afghanistan and whatever, and and as far as lifting morale of the troops, and uh, so they they'll. The musicians are quite accomplished, and you know, it's a tough world on Civilian Street. You know, like from years out to get money, so you either got to busk or you got to join the army band. So, uh, so they send you to a war zone. Is that what you're saying? You can go to a war zone now, playing, playing music. But these days, like I went with the army band last year to Afghanistan and Iraq, and the army band had guns, like had the new style, had the weapon, and they were armed with magazines with bullets, right? And when we were in Afghanistan, they told us, right, when we f if we have to make a crash landing, all the civilian entertainers, we're the ones with the blue bulletproof gear on, it has most put a big bullseye on it, and like, you know, try and get me. And, um, and they told us that all the civilian entertainers had to gather up in a circle, get off the plane, and then the army band would surround us. <laughs> <laughs> and play. Which is a bit of a worry, you know, like that, that's our last form of defence. <laughs> I'm not sure the triangle player might be up to scratch on the, on the weapon, but, um, but then you had real soldiers, and I call them, you know, I'll use that term loosely, I mean the army band guys are real soldiers too, but you have like the, the, the more real soldiers like where they, you know, they're good at shooting and then hopefully <laughs> everything's okay. So on the goat farm we had the does, they had the girls, they gave us the milk and we had a stud buck. Our stud buck's name was Mitchell. And our stud Buck Mitchell, don't know how to tell you lovely people this, but he used to um, like to um, suck himself off. <laughs> it's true, goats are capable of this activity. They've got a curved spine and a penis that can reach their mouth. Those of you that believe in reincarnation might like to keep that in mind. <laughs> You know, I once told that, that, that goat story at a comedy club and uh, a mate of mine was in the audience and he comes up afterwards and goes, you know what, Gary, I can suck myself off. <laughs> <laughs> took me four years of yoga classes. <laughs> now, I don't know if anyone's ever said that to you before. <laughs> but curiosity got the better of me. <laughs> and I'm like, so... Do you swallow? <laughs> to which he replied, no fucking way. I'm not weird. <laughs> uh, coming up, Gary practices some safe sex. It <laughs> gives us an offer we can't refuse. thing in school right like all the girls sat down in the front half of the class and all the boys sat down in the back half of the class and they didn't mix at lunchtime like when I was in England everyone was like mixing them sat, boys and girls sat next to each other come out to this Australian school all the boys separate from all the girls and I was told the reason this was was because all the boys believed the girls had germs and all the girls believed the boys had germs and kids would run up to me at lunchtime and go girls germs no returns <laughs> around trying to pass on the germs onto someone else, right? And they'd all run away, but then they'd stop and go, Barley's. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're familiar with this technique, but apparently, if you cross your fingers like that and say Barley's at the same time, that stops the germs getting through. <laughs> yeah, a little breakthrough in medical science. <laughs> Of course, a few years later, I got out to high school and the teachers came out and told us that boys and girls actually do have germs and we need to wear condoms. You <laughs> <laughs> I haven't always wore condoms, you know, which is a bit of a risk these days, but I'm a risk taker, folks. When I used to ride my bike to primary school, I never wore a stack hat. <laughs> and I figure condoms and stack hats are basically the same thing. They're there for your protection and you really should wear them. But every now and again you think, well, I'm only going to be a few minutes. <laughs> I 
was actually on the dole for two weeks when I moved to Sydney and um, they paid me $300 a fortnight and my rent was $300 a fortnight. So I went, well, this is not enough. So I, I went busking out early in the morning down at Central Station and I made a hundred bucks this one morning and I went, okay, I can, um, I can do this instead of the dole. I'll do this a couple of times a week, I'll get the same money. Were you claiming your busking money? Well, like, you have to give your tax file number and I have claimed it, I have declared it, uh, you, know, you know, that that I know of, because you don't always, when you go and busk and sometimes when you're a desperate comedian, you just really need money. Sometimes I just needed the bus fare to get to a good busking spot. So I have to busk in a bad busking spot to get the money to get to a good busking spot, you know. And uh, Is there any particular day that you made a wallet for? Well, the Olympics in the year 2000 was a, the opening night of the Olympics. I was busking with another saxophone player and um, the two of us called ourselves synchronised saxes. Went out on opening night and made 300 bucks each. You know, which is, it was just a bunch of drunk Aussies that had come out of the stadium, got it piled off the train station. I've never played Waltz and Matilda and Advanced Australia's Fair so much in my life, but it, you know, everyone kept paying up for it, so, you know, I'm happy to do it. Are there spots around that buskers know? Like, have you got your own corners in places like, like hookers? <laughs> <laughs> They're often the same places. Oh, that's handy. <laughs> Did you ever fall foot, you know? <laughs> Did you ever lose money at a game? You know, it's funny, the, the whole corner, like finding a corner, because I've found a couple of spots over the years, and uh, other guys use those spots as well. And um, and then some you have your own individual spots. And the, for, you have sort of etiquette with buskers, you know, if someone's there, you don't go and start playing right nearby the, or whatever, and you sort of work out, Un without even saying anything, I sort of wor worked out this roster with other buskers, like one would be there one morning, you know, and, and it's like, oh, well, I'll do Thursday mornings, and you start to get into a routine, and you're always there. And you can do the shift change, you know, like a guy comes up, oh, you know, how long are you going to be here? Oh, another half an hour, right? He comes back, changes shifts. Did you join other buskers and have, like, little bands or not? Is that too... Well, you spend the money, yeah, and sometimes people come up, you know, and they want to jam with you, you know, and I've got my kind of thing going, and I don't mind if it's good music coming up, so, and generally they won't, a, a good music won't come up and bother to do it, right? You get guys that are sort of half good, you know, got a, you know, and they happen to be carrying a guitar, you know, they haven't got a case for the guitar, they just happen to go, it's not tuned, and, you know, and they can strum a couple of things, and they think, oh, well, you know, and they come, hey, can you, shall we have a bit of a jam, and I'll give them a bit of a go, you know, I'm, I don't mind, and, um, and you try, and then it's like, oh, it's not really adding to it, you know, it's not really making, you know, we're not making any more money, and, uh, you know, but then how do you say, well, I think your time's up, mate. You know, I think, uh, why don't you move along now? Did they ever expect some of the money? A couple have looked, and I give them a buck or something. It's like, oh, whatever. People come up and ask me for money. I'm standing there busking, and people, regular people, go, mate, can I get 50 cents off you to make a phone call? Or, you know, and it's like, can, do you see what I'm doing here? <laughs> you know, it's freezing cold. I'm busking, playing the sax on the street, you know, you've got normal clothes on, where's your key card? When you say normal clothes, do you have a uniform? You dress down when you busk, you know, you've got to dress warm in winter and you dress casual in summer, and you, but you don't want to overdress, you don't look like you're doing too well, and, and I'm not doing too well, so it's easy for me to actually dress down because that's in character with me, you know. I'd have a hard time busking. Well, you would, Daz, you know, because one of the things you have to do is not shave. I mean, you can be shaved and go out for your first day, but then you go out and, you know, you should let it go because then you'll notice as you, as you shave, as it grows a bit longer, you get a bit more cash. Like, oh, this guy can't even afford a razor, you know, like... Poor guy. Mm. Good tips. You guys should come busking with me. What if I could play something? <laughs> I've seen you play a bit of guitar, Daz. You know, I remember, you know, I remember seeing you have it and you were having a bit of a practice. And I don't know, I remember, you know, you playing a bit, Gaz. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having a, having a go at that. I... We could do it. We could do it. That'd be fun. Get the band back together. Best bit about it, Gaz, is that we're going to see Darren looking untidy. Like my hair doesn't even move. <laughs> And you put a beanie on him. So the beanie is a great way to look like down and dishevelled, right? You know, we just we get a dirty beanie, stick it on his head. And I won't shave. We might make a buck. Will you take us to a hot spot? Yeah, well we could go to a I've got a I've got a You know the one near the hooker? <laughs> <laughs> I mean
been doing some research and I've discovered that sometimes it's easier to please a lady than others. And other times we visit your special place, you ladies. We could be down there for months. We forget what we're doing. <laughs> Get up in the morning. Well, that particular activity has really improved my saxophone playing. <laughs> it's improved my tonguing. Still to come, the funniest joke he never wrote, and we head out busking. Hey, how many guys have ever done this? Now, ladies, you might have seen your boyfriends do this at some stage, but how many guys at some stage in their life have put their penis and balls between their legs <laughs> and checked out what they look like as a woman? Because if you haven't, then I haven't done it either. <laughs> But if you have, then maybe I've done it a couple of times. <laughs> If you could spend a day with any celebrity of your choice, who would you pick? Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer, because I really want to go to a Wimbledon final and I don't see anyone else getting close to it for a while. Name something you've never done, but would like to try. I'd like to have an orgy with the Spice Girls, because I want to meet David Beckham. What's the longest you've ever gone without sleep? Thursday to Sunday. What do you order when you eat Chinese food? Chicken chop suey is a, is, a, is a popular one with me. What's the funniest joke you never wrote? A woman looks at herself in the mirror, turns to her husband and says, I look fat, old and ugly. Quick, pay me a compliment. And the husband, without batting an eyelid, says, well, your eyesight's perfect. I like a woman to have meat on her bones. I think women should have meat on their bones, you know? Like, I'm a skinny guy. If I have sex with a skinny girl, we catch on fire. <laughs> like kindling, <laughs> smoke alarm goes off, you're going to get mopped. <laughs> How did you make the transition from music to comedy? When I joined the army I was 18 and then when I was in the army I saw Eddie Murphy's Delirious and I was 19 at the time and that was the first time I, th I saw a guy do, you know, stand up there on stage and walk around the stage telling little stories and making people laugh and I thought you know oh, that's a pretty cool job and I sort of always kept that in my head and I always wanted to be an actor, I always did acting. I left the army for a while, they gave me leave without pay, I took 12 months off, went and started acting in Los Angeles and um, came back, got in a play and thought yeah this is what I'm going to do and then I got into a bit of a party atmosphere and um, let loose a bit and forgot about all the things that were you know <laughs> that I wanted to do and then I went home back to South Australia caught up with the family and sort of went into a rehab type of thing and hung out at Wollonga you know where all the goats used to be <laughs> and got my shit back together and and then I was DJing and I met a comedian in Adelaide Dave Flanagan ran a club in Adelaide I'd set up this whole thing in football park in Adelaide big speakers lugged them up you know set everything up plopped some background music on, this guy walks in, I introduce him, he talks for half an hour, they all laugh, and then he goes, and I think, 
I want to do that. So you came to Sydney to, to uh, give comedy a go yeah. after that? I did it for a couple of years in Adelaide and I, I went, yeah, well, Sydney's, I think, where it's at to go. And I had some friends in Sydney and moved up and having worked at Victoria Barracks on Oxford Street some years ago and then coming back one of my first gigs with, with you Gary that's right I think I did pretty well you know because I hadn't heard any of my material before I was you know I was fresh and enthusiastic you know com comedians getting you know they're only new to it they've only been like two years and they're like they're really keen you know they haven't been jaded and knocked back and and uh, been you know got frustrated with the whole whole thing and I remember saying to the audience Tomorrow you can go to work and say, I went to a comedy show last night and when they ask you who was on you can say, oh there's this guy Gary Bradbury and they go, Gary who? And you can say, yeah he was there as well. <laughs> <laughs> you ever tried to run in thongs? You know, you take about eight, nine steps, that band pops off, thong rolls under your foot, your three toenails hit the cement, the sparks coming off your toenails, you're making a sound like eight dogs fucking a cat and uh, <laughs> Bullied at school? Did you get bullied at school, mate? Do you get bullied? You must have got bullied. <laughs> did they do this? This is what they did at my school, right? They did this thing called the crow peck. That's where you get your middle knuckle, right? And you crack it on someone's head. And, and not just the crow peck, but the dead leg. Dead leg was a favourite at my school, you know. Dead leg! You know, I'm just trying to get a wagon wheel at the canteen, I'm getting a dead leg, a dead arm. Then one day out of the blue, right, as if this wasn't bad enough, the teachers one day decided to give everyone a compass. Every day at school for me was a nightmare, I'm getting compass, grouping, dead leg, I'm thinking, where the fuck's my kangaroo? <laughs> Thank you guys.